thank you very much. So we're waiting for our other uh, presenter to join us. Um, welcome to the webinar. <laughs> uh, we're going to be talking about environmental performance that matters now and tomorrow. And we're really going to be focusing the conversation um, around healthy materials, um, acoustical selections, um, indoor air quality considerations, and then also how third party rating systems will play a role. Um, in keeping our buildings safe um, and healthy also going forward. Um, so just a little note about our presenters. Um, Courtney, like I said, will be joining us shortly. There's David right there and then myself. Um, feel free to do a screen grab of the, um, of, the, um, of the slide to capture our email addresses. And then also what we're gonna be presenting to you guys too is um, a, a Word document that has a whole list of resources from our presentation. Um, uh, everything from what Courtney's been talking about and David and then um, also myself. So you'll also have our contact information for some follow-up. And then um, as far as a learning objectives, um, you know, familiarity with cradle to cradle and living building challenge to clear label and improve those approved finishes, understanding the role of HVAC and COVID-19 transmission and the problems with technological solutions, review the basics of good indoor air quality strategies and how those speak to the current COVID world and as we enter into a post-COVID world, and also understanding the pathways that are available to protecting assets and occupant health through third party uh, building certifications. So I'll just go back to that slide right there. Um, Stephen or Eric, can you chime in real quick just to see where we are with um, with Courtney being able to uh, log in as a panelist? I see he's logged in <clears throat> as an attendee, but um... got it. He hasn't made it over to the panelist side. So um, I feel to maybe keep things moving because we do have um, uh, we do have a full presentation for today. Um, so David, um, do you mind um, going ahead and starting your, your presentation? Um, sure. And then I'll, I'll exit out of this so you can, so you can get going there. <clears throat> Just to confirm, you can share your screen. Awesome, great. Cool. All right, well, we'll get um, started. Uh, hi everyone. David Heinzerling, I'm a principal with Taylor Engineering. Um, I'm going to be uh, sort of covering the HVAC mechanical design um, indoor air quality portion of uh, the seminar. And um, <clears throat> I was sort of going to originally follow up Courtney, uh, who's going to talk a lot about uh, materials and the importance of that. And, and uh, but anyway, we'll we'll switch to that uh, in a bit. So you know, I, I think we wanted to frame this discussion around COVID-19, but um, also how do we get from COVID-19 to post-COVID-19 and how do um, we learn from lessons of COVID-19 and how do they inform new design or um, what we should be doing to our buildings right now. So just to start with the very basics that I'm sure everyone um, is aware of and are all expert in uh, already by now, uh, how is it transmitted? I, I think what people, here is, you know, it's airborne. Um, I, th I think maybe what gets lost a little bit um, in translation is this uh, concept of different size particles. So uh, when someone coughs or sneezes, you know, there's these large respiratory droplets, um, medium sized, and then uh, these airborne or aerosolized uh, particles. 
Um, and they're all potential pathways uh, for transmitting the virus. There's also the surface route or the fomite route, which is considered less um, of an issue uh, as they've studied it more. When we think about HVAC, it's really only impacting this small airborne droplet or aerosol uh, pathway. So if we consider you know, a very simplified um, building here, it's three stories with an error handler on top. You've got an infected person coughing, you know, large droplets, uh, medium-sized droplets, and then these small droplets. Um, and maybe this person that's not quite six feet away or, or um, maybe they're even 10 feet or 15 feet away and the medium-sized droplets can make it that far. Maybe they get uh, <clears throat> exposed to both the medium and the and the small droplets, but the small droplets are airborne, so they can go back up the return air path and back up to the air handler on the roof, and then make it through the filters back into, you know, through the supply system and maybe <clears throat> go to other, other floors. So is this uh, an issue? Um, and so the University of Oregon, um, there's a hospital that did a, a study and they did find uh, viral RNA that had made it back into the central air handler filters and uh, also downstream of those filters. What they um, weren't able to do is test for the viability of that viral RNA. And they, uh, there was no report of any infections um, in areas served by uh, the air handler. So the only <clears throat> place um, there were any infections is in the same room or same zone uh, that someone who is infected uh, is in. And so there's this concept of air handler scale transmission has not proven, um, been proven anywhere uh, by any study. Uh, so <clears throat> why is that? Um, the theory is that uh, the, the virus um, is not all that viable in these small uh, droplets uh, and the um, concentrations are not very high either. By the time you get in, into these really small air aerosols, um, it gets diluted very quickly with all the other air. And by the time it makes it all the way back to the air handler and into you know another zone, it's been diluted so much that uh, it just doesn't um, infect people. So if you go into a hospital or you know uh, Kaiser or whatever, and um, they aren't you know keeping COVID patients in isolation rooms, they're not in negative pressure rooms, uh, the waiting rooms are not anything special. They're using recirculated air. So um, this concept of air handler scale transmission is not something people should be afraid of. So what does that <clears throat> say? Um, it says, it doesn't matter what you do to the filters in the air handler. Um, if this isn't a, a pathway of transmission, that's not an issue. And it doesn't matter um, how much outdoor air you bring in either, because again, if it's not a transmission path, then it doesn't matter what's happening at this at this air handler. So there's a number of recommendations and consequences that sort of come out of this key um, finding. Uh, and this is a, a link to a white paper that we did um, that, that talks about all the different um, HVAC related issues with COVID-19 that you should check out. And I don't have time to go through all of them, but a uh, quick, you know, spoiler alert um, in terms of <laughs> recommendations, wear a mask. Um, you know, if you're with those large and medium sized droplets, you know, there's no way that an HVAC system can protect, you know, against uh, infection from that because um, it's within that, you know, six to 10 feet um, that those droplets already fall out and your HVAC system doesn't matter how, how much ventilation you have, it's not going to do it. Um, and the studies have shown that it, um, there's no practical amount of ventilation that can protect you um, against the aerosol route um, without masks. So even if you're in a room, you're 20 feet away, if there's aerosols um, you know, within that room, if you don't have a mask, it doesn't matter how many air changes you have in that room, you still have um, a, a risk of getting infected. So um, what do you do? Just make sure that uh, your building is working as it's supposed to have been working beforehand, which is provide the ventilation that the code requires you to provide. Uh, and the studies show that if you're wearing a mask, that ventilation rate is sufficient. Um, 
you should go ahead and, and improve your filtration to MERV 13. I just got finished saying that um, you know fil filters don't matter, but they matter for other reasons. Uh, so we'll get into some of those other reasons in a second. But from a COVID-19 perspective, maybe not that big of a deal, but um, wildfire smoke, particularly in the Bay Area and other health um, reasons, bacteria, et cetera, that, are, that go through, um, through the system, you, you will want at least a MERV 13 filter. And then flush, flush the building at least an hour before occupancy. This is already required by code. So again, um, make sure that your building is doing what code is, is already required. Uh, to sort of dive into one specific topic a little bit further, uh, you know, I think at the beginning of the pandemic, one of the recommendations that we heard a lot was switch your air handlers over to 100% outside air. Um, and the problem with that is that it it takes a lot of energy to uh, condition outside air. Uh, and so there was a nice study that was done that compared um, filter efficiency to uh, increasing outdoor air. So on the x-axis, it's the cost, um, annual cost of d these different measures. Uh, and then on the y-axis is the mean relative risk of infection. So the higher uh, is your higher risk of infection. So MERF for a really crappy filter versus you know, a HEPA filter, the best filter. Um, you obviously, as you in, improve your filter, your uh, risk of infection goes down, but then sort of levels out when you get to about MERV 13 um, and you get sort of diminishing returns as you get up to HEPA. But as you get more and more efficient, um, the cost of those filters goes significantly up. Um, and then from an outdoor air perspective, uh, you know, sort of the main takeaway is in order to get the same level of relative risk of infection, um, you have to spend, you know, two, three, four times um, the amount in your annual cost. In this case, it's energy cost for, for conditioning that outside air compared to what you would have to do with a filter. So just a, a key point that filters are better than outside air um, uh, really for any uh, air transmission disease issue, it's not just COVID-19. This was a, a study based on the flu. Um, you know, I, I think a question that often comes up is what do you do in, in small rooms, conference rooms, private offices, hotel rooms, et cetera. Um, I, I love this illustration from the New York Times that is showing this cool HVAC device that's zapping all the coronavirus out of the air uh, in a hotel room. Um, you know, again, the key here is that when you're in the room with someone who's infected, if it's a small enclosed space, it doesn't matter what device you have. It's not going to protect you um, if you don't have a mask. Uh, it, it can be um, helpful to reduce the risk slightly. Um, is it worth it? Uh, you know, not if you're wearing a mask. Um, also, there's this concept of if you want to be, you know, make sure that any uh, leftover viral particles are completely scrubbed. Um, you know, as people move, you know, maybe from a conference room after they're done, they move out and you've got some extra filtration in there and that can be good. But again, if everyone's wearing masks as they should be, it's not, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. You know, I think the, the problem with these devices that we see is that, that it, uh, you know, there's this potential for a false sense of security that if you see this thing in your conference room, that's you know, making noise or generating light or whatever, you think, oh, well, I'm going to be okay because this device is in here. And it's really the key point is there's no device that you can stick in a room and you can be safe without a mask and socially distanced. Um, you know, it's very similar to the concept of, of testing and the, the rose garden and, and everything else. Like everyone thinks that if, oh, if everyone got a negative test, I don't need to wear a mask. And that's how, you know, mass spread <laughs> uh, events happen. Um, Similar here, so don't don't get uh, sucked into to such a thing. Um, the paper uh, covers all sorts of different measures that I don't have time to go into now, uh, and then sort of rates them according to how effective they are in mitigating uh, transmission, their first cost impact, uh, and the environmental impact. So definitely, um, if you have interest in what about uh, this or what about that, um, we cover most of them. So to sort of transition to what, you know, what we should be doing, um, really use this time to, to refocus on the long-touted strategies uh, for good indoor air quality that have been promoted for a long time by a number of these organizations um, rating standards. 
uh, none of that advice, um, uh, you know, is is no, or all of that advice is still true, I should say, um, and and still relevant. So while people are out of you know the buildings, take the time to um, refocus on it. Uh, I think this article from Bloomberg went around the the crep and listserv, but um, it's sort of a nice idea of ways to think about future design. Um, you know, we can't sanitize our way out of disease and uh, the concept of biophilia and positive microbes and um, wanting to connect to nature. And, you know, I, again, I just got finished telling you that outdoor air doesn't matter, but um, it, for COVID-19 transmission, it, it may not, but for uh, a number of other reasons, it matters a lot. Um, and so particularly in climates like where we live in, um, bringing more outdoor air in uh, can be a energy saving, um, you know, uh, uh, strategy, air side economizer. So that has benefits from an energy perspective as well as an indoor air quality perspective. So um, definitely, you know, you do want to uh, use those strategies um, where, where they make sense. Um, I'm going to sort of rush through this because I know we have <laughs> limited time. Um, just a, a quick comment uh, to reiterate, you know, there's a bunch of technology out there that's being sold and sold pretty effectively. I think these bipolar ionization, you've probably heard before, school districts all over the Bay Area are getting, I, I would say, arguably conned uh, into <laughs> purchasing these um, uh, devices that uh, are, do are, are effective. Um, but no more effective than a filter um, is. And if your uh, building is commissioned and doing what it's supposed to be doing, that there should be no need for, for this device. Um, similar with a, the, the UV device, um, Bud Offerman, who's a local expert and in, in, uh, long-term expert in indoor air quality, uh, you know, wrote a nice article here that you should check out if you um, are interested in bipolar ionization and, and uh, sort of breaks down all of their claims. Um, and then, you know, to finish up, lastly, just a plug for, uh, you know, focusing on deferred maintenance commissioning um, to, to improve the indoor air quality and energy savings. And, you know, these charts just sort of show uh, that, um, you know, with commissioning and retro commissioning, you can do a whole lot of energy savings while improving um, ventilation and making sure that your, you know, buildings are all, uh, uh, you know, performing the way that they're supposed to be uh, performing. So this is a, a good time to refocus uh, on those measures. So with that, I'll pass it over to, I think maybe Courtney or back to you, Kyle. <laughs> yeah, um, pass it over to Courtney. And then real quickly for those others that have just joined us on this call, um, we do have a Word document with a full list of resources that are, um, that has linked to the things that Courtney, David, um, and myself will be talking about. So we'll be distributing that towards the end. Um, Courtney, the floor is yours, my friend. Right, great. Uh, let me, do you, did you um, share a screen? Can I share so you'll, you should be able to share screen, yeah. Okay. There we go. Yep, share, great. Here we go. You see my you see my slides? I see a beautiful beach. No, you don't see. So now we see your slides. Yeah. Okay. Set. All right. Great. Um, well, David, at least that's reassuring that building owners don't have to rip out all of their mechanical systems at this point. Um, and you know, we had that initial discussion about you know the comfort that sort of. Some of those images you're seeing of conference room with a big hunker return duct sitting there and you're thinking, is that's reassuring, you know, that's what we need to do, you know, and well, I guess you gave us some more sobering news on that on that matter. Um, I think it's great to see, though, that all these cantilevered uh, patios that are being built on all the all the office buildings in San Francisco right now <laughs> popping out. Um, capturing that outdoor experience, um, that's perhaps even more expensive than doing your HVAC system. Um, but, you know, there are real, really 
exemplary office buildings that are out there that do have, such as the Etsy headquarters that we're going to talk about in my slideshow, that does have that outdoor experience. Anyway, I'm going to be covering healthy green materials and helping you to understand how do we certify them and the living building challenges declare label. The living building challenge has been there's something about it that's so much more approachable than LEED and all these other ones that are, they really are hard to grasp and to get in. They're very difficult, they're very complex and they use a lot of complex language. The Living Building Challenge makes it accessible and it, it's fun. And I think that's why so many people are just, they're gravitating to it anyway. I want to talk first about California's leadership on toxic chemicals starting in, in the 80s. I think everybody can remember what paint used to be like or adhesives for carpets. Um, Bill McDonough's pioneering work in green material science, the living building challenges, um, declare label system, declare certified products, Mohawk carpets. Uh, Etsy headquarters by Gensler, the environmental performance of acoustic products for the hybrid office. Um, California's call to arms on chemicals was Proposition 65. And you can see that familiar label down there that in red below, you've seen it very in many places. It became law in 1986, requires businesses to provide warnings to Californians about significant exposures. It was really the inception of, quasi, of the quasi-nutrition label for building products, that at, la at least it gave you a heads up. Hey, thank you, thanks a lot. Now I know I'm gonna die. Um, now, EcoSeal in a YouTube video praised California's Proposition 65. At a time when California is getting bashed about its, its regulations, EcoSeal is saying, hey, they set a standard that is four times more stringent than US or Canadian standards for wet applied VOCs. So, hey, we should pat ourselves on the back a little bit. Eco Seal is a concrete sealer product. So, in 2019, we banned the use of flame retardant chemicals. Adverse health effects include, but not uh, include endocrine and thyroid disruption, impacts to the immune system, reproductive toxicity, cancer, and adverse effects on fetal and child development. Now, firefighters and children face especially high risk from these chemicals. So this was driven by decades of outdated California standard that even, even though their use provided no meaningful fire safety benefit. Here's William McDonough's poetics here back in the 90s. He raised the question, can we accept any amount of endocrine disrupting chemicals? Ultimately, a regulation is a signal of design failure. It is what we call a license to harm. A permit issued by a government to an industry so that it may dispense sickness, destruction, and death at an acceptable rate. Uh, duck. I'm going to duck now. Um, here comes you know, the impacts. Um, waste equals, here comes cradle to cradle. McDonough's huge, imp, huge contribution. I teach part-time at Laney College and this was a textbook, Cradle to Cradle, uh, came out in 2002. It's a beautiful manifesto for, for changing the way, you know, materials are manufactured, the take back movement, you know, Interface Carpet was the first company, right? To talk about taking carpets back. Um, and creating this technical metabolism to use materials that can be reassembled and reused indefinitely and never, and never head for the landfill. Not an easy protocol to, to meet. Um, it, was, it was, you know, instituted in 2000, it started in 2010. And I think we're just we're just in the infancy of, of really of manufacturers beginning beginning to or heading this direction. In in Venlo, Holland, a Dutch city has has adopted cradle to cradle on a regional scale, in which and they as they put it, it employs a reverse logistics for a new circular economy with safe, healthy products, as opposed to 
the linear economy model, which depletes finite resources to create products that end up in a landfill. It's a tough, it is a tough act to follow. It's a difficult protocol to, to engage in. Now here is, it, it certifies on five levels, basic bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. It utilizes a product optimization scale showing the number of materials and how toxic they are. No certica certification at any level if products contain substances that are on the banned list of chemicals such as PVC, arsenic, or dibutyl phylates. Bronze cradle bronze level has, it requires material reutilization score that is greater than 35%. So material reutilization is obviously a very key part of this certification system protocol. Uh, renewable energy and water stewardship are key credits. Um, Green Guard Gold was the first widely adopted standard for assessing the impact on indoor air quality for products for commercial interiors. Um, this started in 2002 and, you know, focused mostly on VOCs. Green Guard Gold started in 2005. It was formerly known as the Green Guard Children and Schools um, Certification. Um, let's, let's go to this, look at Etsy, which certified using the Living Building Challenge. It's a, a Gensler project on, in a adaptive reuse project in Brooklyn, New York. Um, they, Etsy saw this as a huge opportunity to instigate change, to set a new standard for sustainable construction and, and an opportunity to do salvage. They had a water tower that became the entry stair for their building and to create a space that reflects its values, especially those related to community craft and sustainability. So they created an ultimate sustainable, healthy biophilic workplace, certified it on three pedals of the living building challenge. And of course, given their sort of manufacturing focus, materials was a key priority. So here are the seven pedals, water, site, materials, beauty, health, equity, energy. I think you can see what I was, what I was saying before about how the living building challenge is really, you know, it tries to be very appealing and uh, artful in the way that it rolls its 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 program out. Now, and it also is very clear. Here is the red list. You shall not have any of these chemicals in your products. And there are some of the familiar ones: PVC, uh, cadmium, um, formaldehyde, lead, uh, halogenated flame retardants. Now the biggies for interiors are certainly VOCs and wet applied products like paint and adhesives, as I mentioned, formaldehyde, flame, flame retardants. Now polyfluoroalkylene compounds such as stain and moisture repellents are being phased out. They are still found in some furniture. So look for finish shit finishes or furniture that uses mechanical fasteners rather than adhesives and webbing rather than foam will, keep, will help to keep overall chemical exposure down. So at Etsy, uh, you're going to kind of you're going to read along with me here. <laughs> the team scrutinized more than 1,500 products, everything from it to mess and paint to insulation, millwork, and furniture to scrutinize the group of chemicals that the red list screens for, in order to convince manufacturers and makers to reveal their ingredients in a declare label and adapt their products. Gensler and Etsy developed a two-pronged approach. For makers, they hosted workshops that explained LBC and why it was important. And they suggested alternative materials. The result was 30 maker made products used throughout the headquarters that are free of red listed substances. For commercial manufacturers, the project team hunted for the right stakeholders within each company, a time consuming endeavor. But once the appropriate contacts were identified, many manufacturers were open to modifying their products. So here's the declare compliance levels. We have red list free. We have compliant, which means that the product contains some chemicals on the list. And then also declare, which means that the product is not compliant with the red list or, is it, or its temporary exceptions. So here is one product. This is the Mohawk group that produced a Red, an L, they complied with the LBC red list free uh, requirement. On the top right, um, 
you're going to see that it helps to tell you where it's from, its life expectancy, and where it'll end up at the end of its life. Mohawk has a take, a Mohawk has a take back program. You can see at the bottom, it's the little check there. It is red list free. Um, and here is the here is the Mohawk groups, the pattern and symmetry collection. It's a beautiful carpet. Um, now, a little controversy here. Ironically, as I mentioned, Interface was really the first company to talk about a take back for a carpet. You know, really emphasize you know recycling. They don't. They don't get past the, the uh, LB, they haven't been able to get LBC red list um, certified because of one of their chemicals. But this, well, here's what they say. What the red list misses, for example, Interface's standard America's products are man managed in a certified closed loop system and feature 98% renewable energy, up to 89% recycled materials, no regulated chemicals, zero net contribution to global warming, it's the most sustainable flooring we've ever made, this cradle to cradle certified gold. Our goal is to make products with the lowest carbon footprint possible, products that go beyond neutral to, to help restore the health of the planet. I think you get the point that there are different things that you can sort of, that you can um, optimize on different, different channels. And obviously Interface really has really done a great job on energy and on recycled materials and, and is cradle to cradle certified. And, but they have yet one chemical there that does not allow them to be LBC certified. Um, so I thought I would look a little bit at acoustics for the hybrid office, because as we open up, they will, there'll be less desking, they'll be more creative and collaborative. And that means activities are occurring simultaneously, which requires su superb acoustics. So I thought we'd assess the environmental uh, qualities of these a couple of different products. We have Phil's Felt, it, the square port portfolio made in Germany out of wool felt, is one of the oldest man-made textiles, as felt is a non-woven fabric and does not require a loom for its production. Felt is the natural characteristic of most animal fur to entangle and form mats. So here is some hanging panel solutions. Here is a panel along a wall that is custom fitted. And here at One Medical Headquarters, beautiful display of acoustic panels over a co-working space. And at another, at a, another co-working space in their facility and in a kitchen. Phil's felt is available for furniture, fashion, and vertical surface applications. This felt product is a high quality wool material. It contains no formaldehyde and is 100% VOC free. It holds, it has an Ectotex standard 100, 100 certification. That's a German certification. It is not certified in any of the other standards in the US, I should say. Uh, sheep's wool contains lanolin. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole list there. Um, I'm going to I'm going to show you another product called Heartfelt by Certainteed that I just discovered the other day. Which, if you're look working in a in a large space, big open office office co working space, this would seem to be a good idea. Um, here it is in a, in a in a conference room, and. Here are the certifications. It has green guard and then cradle to cradle bronze. It's a modular ceiling system with felt panels, green guard, and it is non-woven FES fibers, fire rating, good fire rating there, fire spread, recycle content up to 85%. Thank you very much for attending my little talk. <laughs> Thank you so much, Courtney. Um, go ahead and stop the screen sharing, please. Yes. Awesome, thanks. Um, and I'll just get resituated here. All right, so um, we have heard from Courtney and David um, about uh, healthy material selection and what we can do as far as um, acoustics 
um, within that healthy material selection. And then also, you know, it's so um, encouraging to note that our existing um, HVAC um, framework and technology and um, policies and, and code actually really fit the bill uh, for what we need. But um, just to kind of round off this conversation, and hopefully we'll have um, some significant time for, for questions. So I'm going to be a little bit speedy on this. Um, so it's really a question of not if, but when we're going to be dealing with another pandemic. Um, just a little bit of history, noting that in the 20th century, there were three influenza pandemics with tens of thousands of victims. And just in the last 20 years of this century, we're dealing with four similar viral pandemics. So uh, the lesson that needs to be learned is that complacency increases portfolio risk and that our building code needs to e uh, evolve to enhance productions uh, during pandemic events. So why is that important? It's important because with our increased globalization, these are happening with greater frequency. It's happening more broadly. Um, also recognizing that due to shelter in place directives and these work home arrangements, um, indoor occupancy has increased to almost 100%. On that vein of indoor occupancy, the EPA has identified virus as one of the eight most common indoor air pollutants. Um, and that noting that certain pollutants pollutants can be up to five times higher indoors. Um, that's where David's conversation came, comes into play. So health and well-being are really gaining importance as our occupants become more concerned with their role or with the role their building plays in exposure. And one of the outcomes of that, of this quarantine that we've been dealing with is a greater awareness connection between human health and the physical space that we are in. So assume that the tenant demand will continue to grow for buildings that offer a higher standard of care. And this is really a conversation about asset protection. And one way to get there is actually through building certifications. And for the purpose of this conversation, we're just gonna focus on three. But as you can see from this little screen grab that there are a number globally, um, and uh, we're going to focus, uh, focus the conversation on these three. So the United States Green Building Council's leadership in energy and environmental design is globally used. It's really the gold standard of certifications. Well incorporates a lot of the same things. You probably have seen some celebrities throw their name behind um, the healthy uh, rating system uh, with Well. Um, saw a few people that I recognized. So um, it really promotes health and wellness within buildings, communities, and organizations. Uh, and then the FitWell um, is a health focus rating system specifically created by the CDC and the GSA. So let's start with LEED. Uh, last year, uh, USGBC released their global recovery strategy, it's manifest in the form of safety first pilot credits. So a lot of the things that you know we've you have heard in the conversation with David and Courtney. Um, uh, is integrated into these uh, into these uh, into these strategies. So, requiring facilities to create a policy and implement procedures that follow best practices around green cleaning, supporting a healthy uh, indoor work environment and worker safety, re-entering the workplace. There's a tool to assess and plan for re-entry, as well as to measure progress once the space is reoccupied. Um, also, taking into account that some buildings um, during this period of not a lot of occupation um, uh, will increase, uh, may impact some degraded water quality. So there is a building water uh, recommissioning component to, um, to this credit. And then managing indoor air qualities. We also heard from David, you know, building on existing um, air quality requirements within code and within LEED, but also recognizing that there may be some temporary recalibrations to adjust for ventilation that that we, we want to minimize the spread of those contaminants through the air. Uh, how are we doing on time? Uh, well, as we just talked about, this is um, their health safety rating. It's facilities, maintenance, and operational policies is the main focus, scalable and customizable. Um, there's 21 operations and maintenance-based uh, criteria, 17 design-based innovations, 15 of those must be achieved. So cleaning and sanitation, again, is another component to this. Emergency preparedness, re, um, supporting resilience during the case of emergencies. And if you were with us doing during uh, for our resilience in San Francisco real estate conversation a couple of years ago, it's not just about earthquakes or, or other things. We missed the opportunity then to talk about pandemic 
we're talking about it now. Um, health related services for occupiers, um, air and water quality management. And then a real key piece is stakeholder engagement and communications. It's so important to be able to communicate the steps you're taking um, to the occupants and to your tenants. Quickly noting that the US Conference of Mayors passed a resolution encouraging communities around the country to take advantage of these integrated solutions, well building standard being one of them. Um, and now we will move on to FitWell. FitWell um, last August released their viral response module. It's a two-step approval process. It takes approximately six weeks and there's an annual renewal. Um, and it's divided into three required areas. So again, you're not gonna see anything that's gonna surprise you here um, regarding the indoor environment and mitigation of disease transmission, incurring, encouraging behavioral changes uh, such as mask wearing and social distancing, but also building trust among occupants that the space that they're using is safe. And so just as an example of that, Hudson Pacific, Bernardo and others have um, achieved FitWell certification under this viral uh, response module. Uh, and then as far as my takeaways out of this, building certifications are pathways to protecting tenant health and asset protection. So as we also heard from Courtney, you know, the specking of healthy materials using um, uh, products that have gone through the EPD, the environmental product declaration or a healthy product declaration process is a great way to vet those um, considerations. Uh, indoor air quality, as we also heard from David, Great that we don't have to invent anything new, that the existing things um, uh, work, but careful um, uh, maintenance and also continual conversations with your facilities team um, will, will help you mitigate any sort of um, um, problems there. Also from like an owner's um, you know, perspective, um, you know, check with your banking and insurance in institutions. Many are rewarding owners and projects that incorporate resilient strategies, including building certifications like the three uh, logos you see there on the right hand side of your screen. Clearly communicating your actions to keep buildings safe will build trust with your occupants. Having a plan affects people's mental health as well as their ability to perform business and your ability to, um, to maintain the asset. So if you really don't have a sustainability management plan, get one. A number of firms can help you craft one based upon your portfolio pri priorities and goals. And so that is that. And um, I am going to stop sharing. And let's see, um, Stephen, would you be able to share that, that document? Can you hear me? So just as a, as a friendly reminder, um, and, and it may be something where we'll need to follow up. Awesome, thank you. Um, uh, I received a few private notes um, during the course of this conversation that um, some people needed to sign off. So we'll find a way to get you know the that resource document with all the links that we've been talking about in uh, in your hands. So in the la in the ten minutes that we have left, um, which is I'm this is great, um, uh, David and Courtney. What is the one thing out of your presentation um, that you really want people to walk away from as a tool in their um, as a tool in the toolkit, not only to address COVID-related issues now, but what a post-COVID future would actually look like? Um, I guess I'll jump in. Um, I think that that obviously reassuring your employees and putting them first, you know, as they come back, is is. We've been talked about, we've talked about that a lot, and your steps in terms of not only that I mean to do that for them to want to come back it needs to be inviting of course it has to be well designed, and I would think that actually I actually in my mind are more I'm really more focused focused on those acoustic materials, that's going to make the hybrid office a more pleasant place to be, and then of course, it's great that you know a little bit more about let's say even if you're going to a salvage or a reclaim product, let's say you're, um, you just, you found out that there is a heck of a lot of furniture now out on, out on the market that reuse furniture. Well, how do you assess it? How do you look at the labeling on that to see that it is, is you know, the compliant as you'd like it to be? So I think it's nice to have those tools and, and a little bit on that knowledge on the chemistry to suit, make that assessment of, of when you're making those decisions on, 
for your your opening up and the new beautiful office rejuvenated office that will invite people back yeah i guess um on, on my end uh the, the key point um, that I tried to hammer home a lot is just that there's no a magic technology, no magic filter, no magic um, silver bullet that's going to, um, you know, make the air uh, in, in in anywhere, um, you know, safe uh, without masks. Um, and to really use this time to, um, you know, refocus on maintenance and commissioning and uh, make make your buildings. Um, run appropriately. Uh, you know, I think also just, you know, how this informs new design is a really interesting um, discussion. And there, there's a lot regarding architecture <laughs> about open office plans and what's the future of that and uh, conference rooms, et cetera. Um, from an HVAC um, perspective, I don't necessarily think that um, things have are changing that much as I, I tried to sort of lay out for you, but the the concepts of you know increased ventilation that lead and other of these um, uh, rating systems promote are still valid, and you still want that um, biophilia connection outdoors, increased outdoor air for all the other health reasons um, unrelated to COVID transmission. Cool, um, Stephen. I saw your email. If you can just go in and share that file, um, I didn't see it. The, the obvious way to do that. Um, we'll also get started with some Q&A from our attendees. Um, unless, of course, we answered all of your questions and there are no questions. Um, I thought Candace's comments were, were really great. I mean, she was you know talking about uh, Arlene Bloom's leadership to get that retardant chemicals phased out. And then I didn't know her name. Thank you so much, Candace. And and also, we have to thank Rachel Rotman for her work on the, the, Mo, the Mohawk Red List free product. Kenneth, I'd love to get more, a few more of your questions. I think you have some major knowledge in this area. <laughs> if you're still around, <laughs> anyway. Um, Stephen, I'm a little unclear on how that will be um, moderating the questions. Um, I know you had indicated in an email, but um, you could chime in, that would be great. Candace just, just replied. Or if you have any questions, actually, um, so I see, okay. Um, and then I saw a little hand raise um, from, from Candace. Is there a way to, um, to uh, unmute her so she can ask the question. This is weird. This is weird that we can't do that. <laughs> oh, it's yeah. the, you know, it's the webinar format, but yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, so I just got a note that there are no open questions at the moment and I see people kind of dropping off. Um, so, uh, just a real quickly, I'm going to share my screen for those that are still remaining. Actually, that was not the intent. Hold on. Um, Actually, Candace looks like she's right there. We could unmute her. So this is the, um, the document that we will be distributing. Um, as you can see, there's a whole bunch of info here from both of our conversations with live links that we will distribute. Um, so that, that will be coming to you. Um, and uh, just as a, as a quick note, okay, Candace, it looks like talking is permitted on your end. Go for it, Candace. Okay, I just wanted to add about the furniture labeling that um, also uh, work uh, as a result of the good work of Arlene Bloom um, on the flame retardants in the furniture, the labels have been updated and uh, the old labels uh, say that the furniture meets flame retardant standards and there's no check boxes on them or anything. They just say this piece of furniture meets the meets fire standards. It doesn't say mm. flame retardants. And um, the newer labeling, since the laws were changed and now we don't have to include flame retardants, have check boxes and it's clearly marked 
with an X, it either includes flame retardants or it does not include flame retardants. And I recently got some chairs just as a consumer um, uh, from Scandinavia Designs. And I went in on the, uh, this was early, a while ago, a year ago, I went into the sales floor and um, some of the chairs on the floor had the old labels and some had the new labels. Mm. And so I had to, you know, talk to the salespeople and make sure that they didn't get old stock because there's a lot of stuff, especially stuff on sale. And it might be the used furniture for um, interiors that's floating around right now. You should check it out because it's only, I think it was January um, 2019 when the law went effect, went into effect where we um, no longer have to have flame retardants in our uh, foam cushions and mattresses and so forth. A little bit sobering if you're trying to head towards the liquidators to get some cheap furniture, office well, furniture. Look, look under the chair, get down, crawl under the chair <laughs> or whatever yeah. it is because those labels are often still there. People usually leave them on. Wow. So the lesson is read the label. Yeah. <laughs> right. Your nutrition label. Any other uh, any other questions from the um, panels that we have remaining? Thanks, Candice. Appreciate your input. Definitely, Candice. Really, really appreciate it. Feel free to contact us too. Follow up to follow up. Well, and if you want Can Candice's contact info, also feel free to reach out to me. She's one of um, Billy's Foundation board members. So, um, good. Good, yeah. Good. So, all right. All right. Um, thank you all for, for joining us. Um, I, it's great to see that there was also a recording um, going on too. Um, a number of people had reached out, asked if it was going to be recorded. So um, David, Courtney, thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise and attendees. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again in the next Kreppen webinar. Thank you, Kyle, for yeah. organizing this and putting it together. <laughs> this was fun. Thank you. Great to see you guys. Okay, great. All right. All right. Yeah.